during the 40 seconds that it's taken me to uh, get from that seat there. But for that clock to turn round, someone somewhere in the world has just taken their own life. Globally, more than 700,000 men, women and children die by suicide every single year. More than 6,000 in the UK alone. In January 2023, the NHS reported that the number of young people being referred to child and adolescent mental health care services in the UK had exceeded 1 million, a record high. Now, that is equivalent to the entire population of the city of Birmingham in the UK, all being referred to mental health services in a single year. Suicide is the biggest killer of people under 35. Not road traffic accidents, not cancer, not diabetes, not heart attacks. Suicide is the biggest cause of death for this age group. It was on the evening of December the 3rd, 2019, I'd just arrived at my hotel in Solihull in the West Midlands, and I was due to phone my son Jordan that evening. But I was tired, I was uh, hungry, I'd just driven 200 miles from Newcastle upon Tyne, so I decided to send him a WhatsApp message. Hey, George, sorry it's a bit late. Just arrived at my hotel in Solihull via Newcastle today. Quick change and then downstairs for a bite to eat and a beer. How are you doing today? Would you like to have a catch up when I get back to my room? Hi, Dad. That's OK, don't worry. Sounds like a long journey. I'm pretty tired, to be honest. I woke up at 2 AM and didn't get back to sleep. Is it okay if we catch up another time? I'm just going to have some chill time and uh, get an early night. That message from Jordan is timed, you can't quite see that on there, at four minutes past eight that evening. That would be the last engagement I would ever have with my 34-year-old son. The following day, at his home in Horsforth, near Leeds, Jordan took his own life. Now, by most people's estimation, Jordan was a good-looking lad. He came from a close-knit and loving family, and despite his mother and I having separated and divorced some years earlier, we remained good friends. In fact, my ex-wife and my current wife are actually the best of friends, something that my 87-year-old mother from a different generation finds a little weird sometimes when we're all sitting on the sofa together. Jordan was in a loving relationship with his partner, Charlotte. He had his own house. He had a successful career with the Independent Office for Police Conduct as an officer. He had a huge network of friends, many of those from his university days, from his days at school, from his current employer, previous jobs, different jobs and places he travelled and lived, both in the UK and overseas. John was described as the sort of guy who would light up a room when he walked into it, and his dance moves apparently were legendary. I heard many a tale following his death, actually, from his friends who say they'd be out for a drink on a Saturday night in Leeds or Newcastle, and often they'd be looking over their shoulders to say, where is Jordan, only to find him knelt down, speaking with a homeless person or a busker. I heard stories that actually, if any of his friends were struggling, Jordan would often be the first person to be there to lend an ear and lend some support. That was Jordan. That was my son. It's reported that for every death by suicide, 135 other people are impacted. It starts with those first on the scene, the first responders, the ambulance crews. And if the suicide takes place, as it did in Jordan's case at home, those close by in the vicinity, such as the neighbours, become impacted. Very quickly, that ripple effect reaches family and loved ones. And before you know it, the tsunami gathers pace and reaches those work colleagues and ex-work colleagues and anyone known to that individual. Those bereaved by suicide are at a 63% increased risk of attempting to take our own lives. I've heard suicide being described as a bit like a hand grenade going off in your front room. You might survive the initial blast, but the shrapnel kind of stays embedded in you and others for a lifetime. I think any death under traumatic circumstances is painful, but somehow suicide seems to leave its own 
twisted scar behind. And there is an economic cost to every death by suicide. In a recent report published by Samaritans, they estimate that cost to be £1.45 million. Pounds. Initially, it's the cost of the emergency services coming out. That then moves on to the more legal aspects, the coroner's inquest and other legal affairs. All of a sudden, we look at the future lost income and earning potential to the economy of that individual had they continued to live. And other less tangible costs as well. In total, all suicides in the UK account for a cost to the UK economy of over £10 billion. And I know it sounds crass to talk about money and the economy when we're talking about lives lost, but I think it's really important that we understand the full ripple effect of suicide on our society. In September 2023, the government announced its latest national suicide prevention strategy for the next five years, with the government's parliamentary under Secretary of State for Mental Health going on national TV news to say we're making good progress. I'd like you to look at this graph. It shows the suicide rates for England and Wales between 1981 and 2021. What you'll see after many years of a steady decline was around about 2007, 2008, we start to see a slight increase. Now, coincidentally, maybe, that increase relates to a time when we had what many call the latest Great Depression. In fact, the greatest depression since the Second World War. Research shows that during times of recession, suicide numbers actually increase. But once we get through that, look what happens for the next 16 years. The suicide numbers are best flatline on that graph. At worst, they increase. And just before coming to de deliver today's talk, the Office for National Statistics published their most recent suicide figures for England. They showed a 6% increase in suicides on average during that time, an 8% increase in female suicides, and a 5% increase in male suicide. In fact, a rise in registered suicide deaths across virtually every gender age group between 2022 and 2023. I don't think we're making good progress. I think it's time for a radical change in the way that we look after people's lives and prevent suicide in this country. The year 2000 was a global turning point for suicide prevention when Ed Kofi and his team in Detroit at the Henry Ford Healthcare System, having researched how the country has successfully reduced road traffic fatalities, decided to employ the same transformation program to reducing suicide. Their goal was to aim for zero suicides and perfect healthcare. And in fact, over a four year period, they managed to reduce suicides by 80% within the healthcare system, and in 2009 achieved zero suicides for the first time. Now what happened is, as word got around, other healthcare systems in the US started to introduce the zero suicide in healthcare framework, and we now have a National Suicide Prevention Institute in the US. Countries like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, all started to take on board this framework with positive results. Even the UK got wind and they decided to also introduce the zero suicide in healthcare framework with Mersey Care taking a, a real strong lead and actually suggesting they'd seen some positive results. Now, unfortunately, the spirit of collaboration that had worked so well for Ed and his team in Detroit and other places in the world didn't work quite as well in the UK. The concept of zero suicide was met with resistance. And then COVID-19 hit us and during the lockdowns, all plans really to introduce the zero suicide in healthcare framework were scuppered. So where does that leave us? Well, I believe there is hope. I believe that if we can, as a society, learn from what Ed achieved, because when Ed was asked, how did you achieve this? He said, we didn't do anything radical, we just kind of stuck with it. We introduced a process of continuous systemic action learning. We looked at what was working, we did more of it. We introduced new ideas, and if they worked, we continued with those. We removed anything that didn't work. 
We introduced quality circles involving staff and patients and those with lived experience. And what we started to learn was that if we asked better questions earlier and more frequently, such as, are you having thoughts of suicide? And do you have a plan as to when and how you're going to do that? We started to save lives. We started to prevent suicide. In January 2023, 20, together with our collaborative partner, Paul Bittles, the Jordan Legacy that I founded undertook a research project. We went around the UK interviewing dozens of people, people such as heads of national charities, those working in mental health and suicide prevention crisis teams, campaigners, consultants, anyone in the suicide prevention space. And particularly, we spoke to people with lived or living experience of suicide. And we asked them two key questions. We said, do you believe we can significantly reduce the number of suicides in this country from the 6,000 plus we're at right now? And if the answer to that question was yes, how far do you think we can go? On July the 11th, 2023, what would have been Jordan's 38th birthday, we shared the answers to those two questions in what some suicide prevention leaders have called a groundbreaking report. We titled that report, Moving Towards a Zero Suicide Society. And essentially, it maps out how we get those suicide numbers moving on a downward trend towards zero and the practical actions required to get there. That report, which was 84 pages long, we thought might be a bit of a tough read for some people. So we said, how could we condense that information and put it onto one single page? And the idea came in the form of the jigsaw puzzle that you can see on the screen. But I want you to imagine for a moment, just imagine that we move towards a zero suicide society. What would be happening in our schools? What would be happening in our workplaces? What would be happening in our communities? What would society be doing differently if... A zero suicide society, and our definition of that is one that is willing and able to do all it can to prevent all preventable suicides. What if we all contributed to that? How different would our suicide statistics be for this country? When you look at that jigsaw, and I appreciate it's very difficult from where you're sitting here today, we looked at things like making sure there was suicide prevention in our workplaces, that in our schools, our universities and colleges, that suicide prevention was an area of focus there. Our healthcare systems need better training. Most people are stunned to know that most GPs and most mental health crisis teams do not receive suicide prevention training. We then looked at areas such as the government. Last year, the Jordan Legacy um, petitioned to have a Suicide Prevention Act. We got over 10,000 signatures for that petition. We then looked at having a National Suicide Prevention Office, something we recommended to the government, and local suicide prevention partnerships. All pieces of the puzzle. If we could do more in our communities to have better community support and have safer spaces for people to, co to come to, that we looked after people with long-term physical illnesses better. If we looked at technology and how we can use technology for good to identify when someone was in crisis or needed support. All pieces of the puzzle supported at the bottom by lived experience stakeholder involvement and recognising that there are no priority groups to focus on, but everyone is a priority for someone. Now you'll notice on that puzzle there's a missing piece. The missing piece of that puzzle are all the things that we haven't yet considered as far as suicide prevention is concerned. Those ideas that may come from outside of the suicide prevention space. You see, suicide can affect anyone, but anyone can help prevent suicide. When you leave here today, and if any of the message I've shared with you here really impacts with you, you might be asking yourself a question, you know, what can I do? What kind of difference can I actually make? Now, there is a myth that talking about suicide will actually plant the seed of suicide and taking that action in the mind of someone who is struggling. 
we have to start to have the kind of conversations we're having today. We have to use the word suicide. We have to have conversations with people because if we do, we start to create a positive ripple effect where we start to break down the stigma surrounding suicide. Just we heard from Claire before talking about alcohol and, and being the unwanted guest at a party. For too long now, suicide has been that unwanted guest in the mental health space as well. We need to do a better job at listening to people and spotting the signs. That person who's maybe looking a little bit more emotional, they're a bit more sensitive to criticism. We've noticed they may be getting addictive personalities to drink or online gambling. That their language has changed. They're using more language which is defeatist, such as I just don't think I can do this anymore or I just can't cope. We need to be more attuned to this language. We need to be prepared to ask a question that many would find an uncomfortable question to ask. Are you considering ending your own life? The evidence shows that when that question is asked, it usually comes as a great relief to the person who's been asked that question because the first time ever probably in their lives, it validates what they've been thinking and feeling for such a long time. When you leave here today, I'd like you to visit this website. It's the Zero Suicide Alliance, and on there, on their training menu, you will see a 20-minute video. It's a free training video endorsed by the NHS. And what that video will do, it will show you how to have a conversation with someone, how to spot the signs, how to ask that difficult question and signpost that person. And the question that you would probably want to ask would probably go something like this. You know, Steve, sometimes when people are really struggling and they're feeling hopeless, like there's no way out, sometimes they start to have thoughts of not wanting to be here anymore. Sometimes they start to have thoughts of suicide. I need to ask you a question. Are you thinking of ending your own life? We've got to be prepared to ask that question. So I would encourage you to go and watch that 20 minute video in your lunchtime. Looking at everyone in this room, if each of you here were to then go out and share that video with one other person and they were equally to go out and share that video with someone else, we will start to create a positive ripple effect. We will start to create a transformational change in suicide prevention and create a zero suicide society, one that is willing and able to do all it can to prevent suicide. I believe there is hope if we are all willing to come together and join the dots in our communities, in our schools, in our workplaces. We're prepared to become a suicide educated and activated public. We can make a huge difference. One person dies by suicide every 40 seconds somewhere in the world. During the time that I've spent with you here, we've lost between 25 to 27 people. If you're willing to be part of that change, that transformational change and become educated and know what to do if a loved one or a friend is struggling, you can become that positive ripple of hope. Thank you.